Commander-in-Chief Usurer General Crosby Saint retires July 9th. Tonight, a final interview with AFN News Director Ann Mulligan. General Saint, you've been Commander of U.S. Army Europe probably during one of the most dramatic and dynamic periods since the end of World War II. You saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you saw the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, and the uh, changes in the German Democratic Republic. And it's really quite a, quite a change from your days as commander of 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment when you were uh, facing tanks across the border and defending against invasion through the Fulda Gap. And certainly you've had a chance to go back up to Fulda and look across the border and kind of reminisce about you know, what it, way it was then and the way it is now. What does this all mean to you, this tremendous change that you've seen in Europe? Well, you start off by saying uh, the change is an indication of success. I think it's a, uh, a, a personal thing with me, because if you sort of look at it as I came here as a lieutenant, not too long after I came, the wall went up. And just as I get ready to leave town, uh, relatively within a year or so, uh, the wall went down. So it took my lifetime to pull this off. I think um, uh, if I look at it from a personal point of view, I'm very lucky having come at the time I went and served all these different jobs all around Germany. And even when I was in the United States, it was directly related to uh, the protection of Germany, et cetera. Uh, and so I was lucky that I was here at this particular point in time, because I'm no, no genius, but after practicing so much and being around, it helps an awful lot if you have been to Dexheim, if you've been to Ansbach, if you've been to Griebelstadt and all those other places in Gerlstadt. And then when you have to make very difficult decisions, then you have a pretty good idea what you're doing to people. So I was very fortunate to do that. And so it's not all scientific. There's a, a degree of the heart in there. Well, speaking of difficult decisions, one of, another very dynamic time during your uh, tenure here was the Persian Gulf War. And uh, you sort of had to deploy troops, in fact, an entire corps, and then take care of the families back home. Do you have any significant memories or particular instances during that that really stand out? Oh, yeah. I think uh, the conversations that led up to the actual, OK, I want you to deploy a corps, I think are very interesting in, the, in their insights into a real way an organization ought to work. <clears throat> and that General Bono called up and said, uh, we might need some forces out of Germany. This is before the actual fighting, et cetera. And I said, I feel very comfortable that our uh, soldiers are well trained and they have the leadership. And then he said, could you send a corps? And I said, yeah, I think we could probably send a corps. Well, the trick is, can you send it in 60 days? Uh, many of the people say this was the largest movement since World War II. But again, being a little bit prejudiced, I'd say that's true. World War II was larger, but not in a short period of time. So when you move 77,000 people, 600 trains, 400 airplanes, and you go through all those statistics, uh, that is a significant feat that the leadership down in the pit, that's who did it. You know, make no mistake about it. It, is a, uh, it brings tears to your eyes when you went to the railhead, to the airhead, and you watched the soldiers go about their business in such a professional fashion. Uh, made you feel good. One of your initiatives was to improve the conditions under which single soldiers live. Uh, they're now allowed to uh, decorate their own rooms, to, to have visitors, uh, an awful lot more personal freedom. Now, this is not an army-wide policy. And while it's very popular over here, uh, apparently you've gotten some flack from some circles back in the States. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. There are people who talk about, gee, isn't that turning the uh, institution over to the inmates? And I said, wait a minute, if you think of your soldiers as inmates in an institution, then I think you've got a problem before we even go any farther. Secondly, I think you need to go back and say, uh, what's the purpose of the drill? The purpose of the drill was, is someone who is not married entitled to the same treatment as somebody who is married? Do they, are they entitled to be treated as an adult? Or do you expect them to be responsible in their personal life and in their professional life? And if you say, whether you're married or not, I still should hold you to the same standard of conduct, then it doesn't make sense what we were doing before. So it is controversial. I think it's misunderstood by some old goats. Uh, 
but there is no doubt in my mind it's the right way to go. And I think you, there, that's right, there has been some concern in, in other quarters. Some of them talk to me about it, some of them don't. But there isn't anybody that said it isn't a good idea. And there are a lot of them saying, okay, I can't do it all at once, but I think you're right. And so you're seeing a little revolution take a pace. Maybe it's more an evolution taking place. And, and that's a good sign for the Army. It was a visit to Germany and some comments by the Civil Rights Commission chairman uh, last year that touched off some controversy uh, about the user equal opportunity program. Since then, there have been some visits from Washington, some fact-finding studies. Uh, where does it stand now? What were the findings about user as equal opportunity? Well, position? you know, equal opportunity is a difficult thing because it's very difficult to measure. And there were, there still are people who are not happy with decisions that were made about their fate, their selection or non-selection, and they think. Uh, I'm not sure all of them really believe it, but they, uh, they ascribe to their lack of selection in many cases or their punitive action based on their race and not on their performance. Uh, and so the commission came over and looked around and said uh, there's a lot of concern and anxiety out there, uh, but it is not a racist organization. So the bottom line is lots of anxiety. Uh, but it's the drawdown of the Army and what's going to happen to me, which was causing a lot of it and saying, gee whiz, uh, maybe they're not going to keep me or I'm not going to get a fair shake because of my race. Uh, there's no doubt that there are people around who do not act properly, and when we find them, we're usually pretty swift about it. I had to take a look at some of our educational courses to make sure that the leadership is as sensitive as they ought to be. Uh, and since then, uh, we could find no evidence of those 700 or 400 complaints. I keep asking for them, and I still haven't seen them. Uh, but I keep taking a positive attitude. If you uh, make an allegement that you're being mistreated, then I will look into it, or I'll have somebody look into it and come back to me. Um, and so I guess it was a tempest in a teapot, but probably was a good thing because it increased our sensitivity to the issue, and we did have to do some fine tuning. Uh, but I'm glad I wasn't just living in an ivory tower. You look back over your years, what stands out? What are you proudest of? What was your best accomplishment? I would say what I'm proudest about is uh, what the soldiers have done and what the families have done. And I've mentioned it before, but I think the, not only their move to the desert, but the way they conducted themselves in the desert and the way they fought, if you look at what happened. There are a lot of people did some great things, uh, but it's that old saying that was going around here about the Iraqi saying, the guys in the, in the tan are tough, but look out for the ones in green because they came out of Europe, and uh, that proved to be correct. And if you go look at the battle history of the first armored and the third armored and the second cav, when they came up on the enemy, it was like a firestorm. I mean, it, they just wiped them off the map. Could have gone differently, but because of the troops, it didn't. The way the families hung together uh, was a significant event. The way the soldiers who got left behind, like me, the way they did, a lot of people don't know, we moved almost 200,000 tons of ammunition in addition to the Corps. The stuff, we moved 600 tanks in addition to the Corps. It required people to work on holidays and weekends, etc. And I don't think the people that did those things got the recognition in, in the United States uh, that I, as a prejudiced individual and a proud uh, commander, think they should have. But then again, there are lots of troops that do good work that don't get the recognition maybe that they should have. Okay. Thank you very much, General Saint, for sharing your experiences and thoughts with us on AFN. It's been my pleasure to uh, serve in you, sir, uh, with you personally over a long period of time, if you recall back into the 70s. Uh, and it's been my pleasure to be associated with the great soldiers and families.